Hello, Mr. Big Orange Carrot. How are you? I'm pretty good. Thank you for having me on. Uh, excited with uh, Bitcoin reaching all-time highs before the halving. So uh, I'm sure it will yeah. be an exciting uh, talk today. Well, we love having you on. We're glad you haven't been eaten by a rabbit. And, uh, <laughs> we know that we know that the previous shows we've been made have been very popular. People like your analysis. Uh, I think your spiral chart is my favorite chart in the history of Bitcoin. Um, Thank you. I have, yeah. a, I have a feeling there's a possibility things are gonna things are gonna change now. The model might it might do something it's not done before. But like, listen, you're you're the guy. You tell us where do you want to start. Yeah, so um, yeah, I guess uh, we'll do a little bit of a follow up again of the of the last one. I think it mm -hmm. was in Miami, right? The last time it we was. recorded, and uh, yeah, May so twenty three. Yeah, yeah, it's been some time. Quite a lot happened since, and uh, so I think actually the the spiral chart was spot on since that time, uh, except for now it starts to seem uh, that it, it might start shifting because of the ETFs. But but I, I kind of want to go into those dynamics. I think uh, those are very uh, interesting. Uh, and, uh, and and necessary to kind of follow up on. So, so let's uh, maybe jump to to the chart. So I want to talk. I want to start off with uh, with the spiral. Um, and we're looking actually at the view here, uh, starting at 2017. So around the 2017 cycle peak. Uh, so those are those big two green dots that you see there on the right. And um, just I I mean I think most of the people understand already the the concept of this chart, but just a very quick follow up. Uh, so so a full rotation in the chart is a, is a period of four years. So we started actually in two thousand nine at that uh, a vertical uh, orange line, and uh, then a full rotation is four years. So we go two thousand nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and then and the next cycle is thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and then a quarter rotation uh, 2017 that's where we are now in that chart and so each ring in the chart is times 10 in, and that's the price uh, uh, so we go from a dollar to ten dollars to a hundred dollars and so forth what i did with this with this chart is um, I actually color coded the 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 price uh, based on on chain data. So based on the short term holder cost basis, that is the the average purchase price of short term holders, which has been uh, a very it's one of those fundamental on chain indicators uh, that that does a very good job at kind of indicating where price might might go or where there's a support level. Uh, you know, the, the short term holder cost basis serves as a support level during bull markets and and kind of resistance during bear markets. But using the distance of the actual price compared to the short term holder average purchase price, so the short term holder cost basis, uh, that that gives us uh, that allows us to color code the price information. And so we can actually uh, vis visually see the difference between bull and bear markets. And so um, so what I want to do is uh, another concept that I added to, uh, to this chart is actually the, the Wall Street cheat sheet because yep. um, you know, uh, uh, on-chain analysis allows really to look at the psychology of the market that's going on. And so what I try to do, um, so, so I also called this the Bitcoin cheat sheet. Actually, my, my Amsterdam presentation wasn't this as well, but I want to kind of give an update on where we are now. And so um, uh, we, we, tr we kind of try to identify the different phases that, uh, that are happening in Bitcoin and where we are now in the cycle. And so um, everyone has seen this Wall Street cheat sheet, I suppose. And so... Uh, so what I want to uh, do now is like we start actually at the euphoria phase there in 2017, where really people feel like they are genius, and then we're going to spin. Uh, we're going to spin, and then people think obviously that price is going to keep on going up, but then we get this complacency phase, and then the denial phase, and then people start panicking, and then uh, it, it, you know we people actually capitulate and they start getting a little more uh, angry. And then they feel like an idiot suddenly, you know, where before they felt like a genius. And 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 then it, it, it's kind of slow recovery. We get this enduring phase and where there's really like a lot of stagnation going on, like with a lot of sucker rallies. And, and then there is a rally, but people are still in disbelief and doubt, you know, like is the having priced in, for example, uh, you know, those are just coming feelings. And then we actually get this blue dot that is that is the having that is going on. Uh, and usually we get a calm phase after the halving, and but then the optimism really starts coming, 
And then we get like people start really believing we get these all time highs. And uh, often we get that's followed by a, an intermission. And then we get like the true trill phase where they start to like telling everyone like, oh, you should buy. And then again, we feel like a genius. And so uh, that we, 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 we fall back into the same cycle, complacency, denial. We're now in the 2022 bear market. I, gu I guess most people that are uh, watching this, uh, they, they kind of are familiar with the sentiment that was going on there. We make another bottom. And so actually the, this, this, uh, this way of identifying the phases has been spot on since the bottom. We, we went through this uh, depression kind of phase and then we really got this stagnation phase with a lot of disbelief recently where people thought like, no, this is not going like uh, not going anywhere. And then we had this doubt, like, is the having priced in or is are the ETFs priced in? Right. That was like the, the, the common feeling that we've uh, been having for the for the past few months. And so. And so this is where we are kind of now. So uh, we're now in this phase of doubt. Is the having price in? Is the ETF price in? And I, I guess uh, we, we might be a little past now. And, I, and, yeah. and I, that's what I want to get into now is because we actually had the ETF approval um, you know, right at the beginning of, uh, of the year. And uh, the having, which is coming up in April of the year, which are uh, marked here in the chart. And so, uh, so I, what, I, what I think is uh, interesting is that the ETF approval has been such a catalyst, uh, you know, uh, equal in nature to the ones of the having. And because we were kind of leading up towards that approval, uh, you know, the cycle might have started shifting or we might have skipped the phase because uh, we're now like, you know, the question is, are we still in a doubt phase or are we already in the opposite? optimism phase, right? Because we just made an all-time high. Okay, firstly, can I just say what a beautiful animation this is? This is some great work. If you're listening to this on the audio, I recommend you uh, hop off, uh, jump to our YouTube and watch this. I think you're visually going to want to see this. And plus, we get double the downloads. Uh, so uh, definitely go and check that out. The thing I was coming to is I think we've jumped. I think we've jumped a phase. I think we're in belief right now. Yeah, so I, I think we're still in the optimism phase, but uh, but but yeah, I uh, I agree. So I think we have shifted, and uh, so I want to go into those dynamics a little bit, and we'll see. Uh, we'll, uh, but but indeed, I, and I think the main reason are the ETFs uh, as a catalyst, and mm. uh, so I, I uh, let's let's go into those dynamics uh, in in the next charts. Um, ah, yeah. So so also what I wanted to still say is. Um, uh, that that uh, the the next cycle peak doesn't have to necessarily fall uh, within uh, you know in that uh, green circle that you can see here. So that would be the end of 2025. Uh, I think uh, it's it's possible to have a cycle peak earlier uh, due to uh, the 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 catalyst being earlier with the ETFs. And um, but but we could also still stay within the four year cycle by perhaps having uh, a double top. So maybe we'll have like a, a bull run and then a, a longer than usual intermission. And, and then we might still make a, a cycle peak around that same period in, 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 in the end of 2025. Uh, I cannot predict the future, obviously. So uh, I, I go just by the indicators. Uh, so but uh, but yeah, the, the four year cycle would imply a, a peak near the end of 2025. So but perhaps we're 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 uh, uh, kind of shifting a little bit and uh, the ETFs might have speed up uh, things a little bit. And so, so let's, uh, let's uh, look at the uh, ETFs uh, um, then for uh, like how they are a catalyst. And, and so uh, the, the next chart I would like to discuss is the ETF tracker. Um, so I, I actually I built this ETF tracker. It's available on the Bitcoin strategy platform slash ETF. It's freely freely available. So I, I don't want to advertise the, the platform here, but but uh, I, I kind of want to show this overview just to have an overview of the spot ETFs that are uh, that are there and their their holdings because actually BlackRock uh, accumulated already uh, nearly two hundred thousand Bitcoin in less than two months. So that is uh, that's very significant, uh, and and so these inflows are really gigantic more than I. I expected, and uh, to me, um, you know, if we if we wouldn't have had this this ETF catalyst, um, uh, my my prediction was always kind of like 40k around the having, but uh, but with the ETFs and the, the ETF catalyst, uh, we have really seen substantial inflows, and for me that was always a, a bit of a wild card. Like I didn't know how much inflows there were going to be from these ETFs, and so I first wanted to see the data and. Um, you know, in my newsletter, I've been discussing this for months. Uh, 
uh, like the potential impact of ETFs, but uh, but we but we first needed to see data, and we still have little data to be honest. It's it's just less than two months, but but the inflows currently are uh, are truly amazing, and so uh, uh, I think. Um, uh, we have seen days of 10,000 Bitcoin that were added uh, to the holdings, and that is that is uh, that is really impressive. And I mean, so, BlackRock did nearly 12,500 yesterday. Yeah, that is the highest uh, ever recorded. So, uh, so uh, it, 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 indeed, uh, that's that's enormous. And uh, Grayscale has seen uh, a lot of outflows. Uh, so. Um, uh, uh, they, and that is uh, because they have this this high fees. Uh, they they charge one and a half percent fees. Uh, but maybe we can we can go to the uh, the next chart um, where uh, we we actually see the the cumulative Bitcoin holdings of the ETF. So mm. here you can also clearly see Grayscale, BlackRock, Fidelity. Uh, those are the biggest ones, right? But Grayscale has this history. They they were they they actually converted to an ETF from a, a, a trust before. So they had a, a, a ten year head start basically to the to the other ETFs or even thirteen years I, I believe. And so they they actually accumulated already six hundred thousand bitcoins over that time. And um, with the approval, uh, we, they actually started getting competition. Right. So. Uh, uh, BlackRock Fidelity, they offer very low fees. Uh, they only offer 0.25% fees or so per year, whereas Grayscale uh, still charges 1.5%. Uh, and so a lot of uh, Grayscale has seen a lot of outflows. Um, uh, also, uh, still there's a bit of aftermath going on of the bear market because we actually saw a sell off of uh, the FTX uh, GBTC uh, shares. And, and so that was an outflow of Grayscale. And currently, we're actually, uh, I think we are seeing uh, outflows of Grayscale due to the Genesis bankruptcy uh, as well. And so um, there's various reasons why Grayscale is not lowering their fees. I think um, uh, I think actually their, the parent company, DCG, might not be in the best uh, economic uh, situation. And so uh, the Grayscale fees uh, are... Uh, are a bit big part of their uh, income, and so lowering the fees would basically mean dividing their income by six, right? So, so there's this. Uh, I, I, I guess I mean at some point they will have to lower fees, but uh, but they also make a lot of money on uh, on the trades of these outflows. So, uh, so I, I don't know what is the exact point in time that they're going to lower the fees, but I, I expect at some point that it's going to be economically more uh, interesting to lower the fees than to keep the fees high. Uh, so, so that is my my view on that, and and so you can see that that all these outflows of Grayscale have been uh, more than offset by uh, BlackRock, Fidelity, and and the other ETFs, uh, but mainly yeah. BlackRock. Again, great chart, man. Uh, just a quick question: with BlackRock, do we know if they are uh, only investing on, on behalf of other people, or do we know if they're actually accumulating for themselves? Mm, well, I. I think it's mainly on behalf of other people, but uh, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, th they have around 300 ETFs, and the Bitcoin ETF is actually a, a, a really significant part of the volume that they're currently doing. So I'm sure they're waking up uh, to Bitcoin, if not already. I, I mean, they, they I, I cannot expect that they do not hatch or that they don't hold a Bitcoin position, to be honest. Yeah. Because anyone, anyone they've invested on behalf of already has made some good and significant returns, and I wonder how much FOMO is existing within their clients, uh, people who've invested and are now doubling down, tripling down, wanting to have a higher allocation, and how much is just FOMO of people are like, oh shit, I need to get on board with this. Yeah, so I think uh, the interesting thing is that since these are secondary markets, the prices on these ETFs are trading different than the, the Bitcoin price. And so a lot of times it just comes down to like these financial advisors recommending uh, a portfolio allocation of, for example, 1%. You know, they just say like, oh, if, if, uh, if you add a 1% Bitcoin allocation to your portfolio, uh, you know, you will have, uh, you will have better performance. And, 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 and so uh, that is even often just independent of price, you know, like, and so obviously these financial advisors as well make a, 
uh, make money on uh, on this as well. So they're economically incentivized to offer these products. And so I think uh, that it, that is just very interesting. I think this is actually in the future going to generate a lot of passive flows even for 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 Bitcoin. So um, we are actually just still at the start. I mean, many of these products uh, will still have to evolve over time. But I, I imagine at some point in the future, just a general uh, employee is going to have a salary and then an automatic uh, uh, automatically, obviously, they they save for their pension, and then through that pension fund, like a one percent uh, 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 allocation is going to be made to Bitcoin, and so they actually become uh, they 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 are starting to stack Sats indirectly, you know, like and and so I think this is very very bullish for the future. We're going to have a, a lot of like new passive uh, basic uh, flows towards Bitcoin through these kind of products. Yeah, it could get. I mean, we could be super early on these allocations as well. Yeah, I, I still think that the majority is not there. This is just like I still think. Also, this is mainly retail, uh, not not so much institution uh, institutions yet. So mm. it's uh, it's mainly like financial planners like trying to uh, tell uh, just general families like uh, you should have a one percent allocation to Bitcoin, and 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 so that I think is mostly what we're seeing now. But but this is still going to evolve. We're still very early on uh, of this, so I, I think it's still going to generate like these inflows. I think will increase over time. Although we do have a bit of hype now, uh, obviously. And so um, uh, to me, it's also still very little data. I mean, we only have two months of inflows um, at a time that the, the stock market is making all-time highs, gold is making all-time highs. And so uh, the question is, how will we perform uh, when the macro environment is a little less uh, uh, you know, uh, supportive of of all these uh, uh, of of this type type of uh, behavior, like this the, the high risk appetite that we're seeing currently. Hmm. And again, another great chart. If you're listening, you really need to go and uh, look at the YouTube and see these charts. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. So the the most important part of the ETF tracker, in my opinion, is actually so tracking the growth rate of the the combined Bitcoin holdings because this is actually uh, the growth rate of of the Bitcoin holdings is what is going to put pressure on price, right? This is going to be the demand for Bitcoin, and so um, this has been my favorite chart of the ETF tracker. Um, it's uh, uh, you can see the the. Uh, the daily inflow, the, the daily net flows of uh, uh, of of these uh, ETFs, and um, I also added here the the GBTC, so grayscale, the grayscale outflows, and the combined. Uh, so in blue, you can see the combined other nine ETFs, which are have mainly inflows, and so um, they kind of offset each other a little bit uh, still. Uh, but but you can see that most of the net flows are in green. And so, um, so that's a so it's a very positive. <laughs> it puts a pressure on price, yeah. right? Well, what, the read from this is you can tell why when we I think didn't we shoot up to like fifty nine k or something on the launch day, and then we dipped back down. Exactly. So we we actually uh, shot up because indeed of these high inflows to the ETFs, and then we we went down because of the uh, FTX sell off. That it was actually the first. Uh, uh, Downside. So this first, uh, when when the price, uh, when the growth rate there goes negative, that was actually the sell off of uh, of FTX. Yeah. And the, and the, and the current uh, sell off, which we see, which is a bit less intense, is possibly due to the Genesis bankruptcy yeah. there. And, yeah. And and so again, that puts a little pressure on price. Although we're now having such so much inflows that that is kind of uh, even neglectable. You know. Yeah. I mean, look, for anyone listening, it, it, we have essentially. One significant dip of what one, two, three, four, five days, right? Uh, from three days in, and then we have like two di single dip days, and the rest of the time we've spent in positive inflows. Um, I think on that grayscale one, you've also got the people who played the arb trade when they knew the when when there was like the high expectation that GBTC was going to convert to uh, an ETF. There was a lot of people buying the discount. True, and and uh, to me, the most amazing part of <laughs> of this is that if we look at the average net inflows, so since the since the launch of the of the ETF approval, we can see that we added about three point nine uh, k bit BTC per day. So that is the demand from these ETFs currently, 
And this is really significant. If we think of the Ford halving, uh, where we'll go actually from a supply issuance from 900 coins a day to 450 coins a day, the 4,000 coins a day of demand, that is, <laughs> that, is, that is actually comparable to the first halving. So, so actually what we're seeing is the ETF is, uh, is functioning uh, of similar magnitude to the first halving. So we're actually having a first halving and the fourth having in a time span of less than four months. And I think, yeah, people are underestimating the impact of this. Uh, I, I mean, we, it, it's not for, uh, it, we have made an all-time high within two months of this first having, let's say, the ETF approval. Now, it's, it's not literally a first having because uh, obviously the, the ETF, it's, it's a demand shock rather than a supply shock. So we have a demand shock, but this demand shock by the ETFs is uh, causes a supply crunch, right? And so, it's it's in a way uh, very similar. And uh, th the thing is with ETFs, it it will fluctuate a lot, right? So we had we had these huge increases and and some uh, decreases. For example, to the uh, FTX sell-off, where with a having obviously it's just a reduction in supply, and so that is fixed, and it will always kind of stay the same. And so it's uh, uh, the ETFs is a lot more volatile in a way that it it, it you can have suddenly 12,000 inflows on a day and then, uh, and then uh, 5,000 outflows on the other day. And so, but, but on average, uh, we've been adding 3.9K uh, BTC per day to these ETFs. And so, um, so that, is, that is truly amazing. That is really comparable to the impact of the first halving, which, uh, yeah, to me is still, uh, that, that is just incredible. Uh, and, and it's not strange that we've made an all-time high uh, with such a demand, to be honest, uh, we we haven't had a pre uh, halving all time high before, have we? No, we have never done that. Yeah. No, we have had uh, an all time high fairly soon after the first halving. So uh, actually, a similar amount of time. Uh, so we, you know, also the first halving obviously was a huge supply shock, and and that caused an all time high two months after, uh, or I I don't know if it's exactly two months, but a short time uh, really after the first halving, we we made an all time high, and currently we're seeing that as well. Hmm. Um, now, obviously, a, a reduction in supply. Uh, does not uh, so a having which is uh, a, a really causing a supply shock does not say anything about the demand. So if if the demand starts to increase, uh, but here we're actually uh, including the demand, right? This is the demand. So uh, so it's similar to a supply shock of the first having, but it it it's actually representing a quite large portion of the demand that is currently flowing into Bitcoin. How bullish are you, Danny? I'm always so bullish. I'm curious, how, what are the sort of actual Bitcoin holders doing during this? Are they still holding their coins or are you starting to see those move to exchanges? Yeah, so we see a lot of, uh, uh, so the Hotler group, which uh, actually I have a chart on this uh, in a little bit. The Hotler group, uh, they, they do sell off uh, some of their coins uh, always uh, as uh, when all time highs are, are, are being made, right? So, so in the bull market, uh, it's, it's the so-called smart money, let's say, although you could question if it's smart to ever sell your Bitcoin, but uh, but they they obviously uh, when when hodlers have a profit of around two hundred and fifty percent, they yeah usually they take some chips off the table, right? So so it's uh, it's it's uh, it's normal. We have seen it in every uh, bull market, and uh, and so there is a natural selling of uh, of of the hodlers because maybe I should clarify a little bit on this uh, supply shock uh, because it's, there's always enough supply, right? In a way, there <laughs> there is never a supply shock. Uh, it's just uh, price will just go up and new supply will become available. That's just the dynamic that that is going on. So you can only have a supply shock at a certain price level, and and as soon as price starts moving up, uh, uh, then then there's no longer a supply shock, right? But uh, but obviously, this this, uh, this new demand, four thousand, uh, nearly four thousand uh, Bitcoin per day, uh, is causing a severe supply crunch and is putting a lot of pressure on 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 price uh, towards the upside. And we still don't have retail here really yet. No, well. this is only the start. Actually, this week I started receiving some messages, like uh, you know, Ooh. from people that are kind of waking up and and that they're finding out about the all-time highs and 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 so. Uh, 
it's it, we're we're still at the very beginning of 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 a bull market in my opinion yeah i've had my first two phone calls this week <laughs> i yeah, me, me yeah i got some Typical messages questions but, mm -hmm, yeah, dip, should I, exactly. when's the dip yeah should i wait for the dip <laughs> you know uh well how high do you think it's gonna go yeah should i shit coin like this all the, the exact same questions you get every every single time I've had the the fair weather Bitcoiners that were around last cycle a little bit come back, and then one new person. That's it. Yeah, so, so we're still early on. To me, yeah. So this week, I, I've received a few messages, which was a first, uh, uh, and and so to me, that's the sign that that retail is starting to to wake up, and uh, and and that's a uh, that's also for me uh, the reason to start believing that that yeah, we're really we're going to see a continuation of this trend because these ETF flows are not going to stop. Uh, at least, I mean, they might, they might uh, maybe decrease a little, but uh, uh, you know, in, in the worst case. But we're not going to go immediately negative after having seen two months of of positive inflows. And so the pressure is going to keep on continuing. Retail is starting to wake up, and so to me, it's way more likely that we're going to see a continuation than uh, and, and instead of uh, of of having now a severe intermission. Uh, but uh, based on 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 the flows I'm seeing. Um, so maybe we can we can jump to the to the next chart, um, which uh, is the the Bitcoin halvings, which uh, I aligned the, the, the each cycle from having to having, uh, and uh, I scaled them by the realized price. So that is the dotted the the dotted line. Um, so the the that is the average purchase price of all Bitcoin. Now, why do I use that? Um, the average purchase price is actually based on the true capital inflow into Bitcoin that we can see on chain. And uh, so unlike price, which is very volatile, um, this, uh, this, is, uh, this moves uh, just more gradual. And I think it's better to use it as, a, as, a line, as an alignment tool. And so, so if we align the cycles this way, um, we can uh, see that the ETF approval, which I, 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 I uh, highlighted here as well, and the next halving, they really fall all uh, within a similar range, right? So each each halving is a bit different in length because it's obviously based on on block time, uh, and so depending on the hash rate uh, increase and uh, difficulty adjustment, uh, which kicks has to kick in, like uh, you get a bit of uh, of slight differences in length uh, between uh, each halving. Uh, but we can see that the ETF approval actually falls perfectly within the previous two halvings. And so we have uh, a second catalyst this cycle, uh, which falls exactly in line with the previous halvings, to be honest. And, and so uh, that, that, uh, uh, that makes this cycle, uh, I, I think we're, we're going to have to continue uh, in, in a similar fashion again from the ETF approval onwards now. And so I think uh, if you... If you think that the ETF is even a stronger catalyst than the next halving, which in, in my opinion it is, then it, it makes actually more sense to, to align the cycles by the previous halvings and the current ETF catalyst instead of the next halving. Halving three has a slightly different structure in that the second top isn't as big. Do you think that is just we got absolutely fucked by Luna, FTX, Celsius, Block, BlockFi, just... There was so much leverage and uh, selling off for those kind of failed projects that it, dis it essentially stopped ha us having that second kind of uh, higher top. Yeah, I no, I actually uh, I believe the dynamics are a little different. We, okay. We'll also get to that. I have a, a chart uh, of that, uh, that that's coming up, so I'll de I'll definitely get back to that question because we're gonna uh, the, we're actually we'll talk about the the, the November twenty twenty one uh, all time high versus the April twenty twenty uh, all time high, and 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 uh, how how those dynamics are. So uh, I, I believe we just made a longer uh, uh, a higher high practically. So it was an all time high by coincidence, but. Uh, or not really coincidence, but uh, there was it was really based on long-term holder behavior and not on hype in the market. The hype was already gone after April. But yeah, I, I'll get back to that with uh, with a follow-up chart. Uh, but what what I wanted to kind of get to was that the the ETF approval and the halvings could be seen as the catalyst, and so we can uh, instead of aligning the current cycle by the next halving, um, I think because uh, each cycle. Obviously, each cycle has only rhymes, right? So we have like unique, unique events in each cycle, and and maybe I mean just to go back, if you look at the 
the uh, the orange cycle here, the the 2009, uh, the 2019, um, uh, it was still kind of bear market, but we had this mini bull. Uh, we had this mini bull in the 2019 uh, bear market, right? That was a bit of a unique event, uh, not seen in other cycles. And so each each cycle has kind of unique events depending on events that are playing out uh, just in real time. And so, uh, uh, for example, also uh, in in the uh, 2021 bull market, we had this uh, the, the mining capitulation uh, uh, event, right? The China mining ban. And so that's also again, a particular specific event to that cycle. And so uh, this cycle, we have the ETF approval. And so, uh, but the ETF approval really could be seen as a catalyst uh, and, uh, of magnitude to... Hold on. Yeah. Is the ETF, the ETF this, uh, is this cycle's Michael Saylor? Are we, are we looking for a main player, but the main player is BlackRock? Yeah, so I, I, I think, uh, I mean, Michael Saylor is doing an incredible job as well with, uh, with uh, accumulating Bitcoin. And uh, basically, it's just a different way of allocating uh, to Bitcoin, right? Buying, buying MicroStrategy stock. Um, so so both it, uh, they're both adding and both there are, are actually putting uh, pressure on, on Bitcoin's price. Uh, but I think eventually uh, uh, BlackRock will indeed overtake uh, Michael Saylor because they already accumulated... Uh, cool. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, yeah, they, Maybe they already, today. yeah, they already accumulated two hundred thousand Bitcoin in in less than two months. And so, if if we keep up this pace, uh, that's going to be uh, really a lot of uh, a lot of Bitcoin, obviously on behalf of others, right? Yeah, but it's you know every cycle has a main player, and I just feel like it's BlackRock. Yeah, I think yeah, I would also argue it's uh, it's BlackRock this cycle rather than uh, Michael Saylor was definitely last cycle, <laughs> uh, a big influence. But uh, I think indeed uh, BlackRock will overtake it uh, this cycle. Hmm. And so uh, so just to get back to like the ETF uh, approval and the halving. So we have here the alignment of the previous halvings, which is that gray uh, vertical line there, uh, with the ETF approval of the current cycle. So the current cycle is in this. Uh, sort of magenta color, um, and and um, so we're we're actually you know because the ETF approval could be seen as kind of a having uh, event, like similar to the magnitude of the first having. Even we we have gone up and we've shot up in price, and actually that green cycle that you can see here is the uh, first after the first having. Mm -hmm. So so that is uh, how price performed after that first having. That is that uh, that the green cycle. It's uh, the 2013 uh, cycle. Uh, now. I do not expect to go up to uh, seven hundred thousand or something, uh, you know, as fast as that green cycle does here. Uh, why not? Uh, why not? Because um, there we have a lot higher market cap now. Bitcoin's, you know, a lot less capital was needed back in the day. You know, when Bitcoin was trading uh, around prices of a hundred dollars, then. But we have more buyers who have more capital themselves. True. Uh, but still, I think the the growth of a market cap and just the general increase of a market cap it it allows uh, uh, there's just a, a seller sooner for for every coin that has to be bought and so uh, so I, I don't think we will see you know the, an increase in market cap will kind of cause these diminishing returns with each cycle uh, but obviously an increase in scarcity will uh, again have the opposite effect it will put upwards pressure on on price. And uh, I, I mean, I'm not saying that it's not possible, but I, I, what I expect actually to happen is that we will, we will be more similar in magnitude of the previous cycle, which still would be extremely bullish, to be honest. If we reach mm. prices of uh, above 200K, we're actually um, uh, of a similar magnitude. We're, uh, you know, in a similar magnitude of the, of the last cycle. And that would actually indent, uh, like, uh, in, uh, um, signify that we don't have uh, diminishing returns so that is that is already a big thing in my opinion uh, mm. but how i think it will play out but but i don't know uh, obviously the market is irrational uh, at times so <laughs> uh, but but i think uh, maybe we'll see a similar um, uh, behavior to the to the previous uh, cycle where uh, you know here you can see the, the orange cycle which kind of moves ahead of the of the yellow uh, cycle but then falls below it later on right so 
we spoke with Checkmate yesterday. Me, Danny, and Checkmate had a bet. What What is the bet about? We all put. We all put. Was it a hundred? Was it a million sats? Hundred k sats each. Hundred k sats in each. What we think the uh, uh, the the highest price of the cycle, the the the, the top before the end of twenty twenty five. I actually like your your guess on that, Pete. What did you go with again? Two hundred and eighty two. And I went three eighty. Three eighty fifty. No, no, no. I think that might have been checked. I wrote it down in our bets. He went two fifty. In our bets app. Yeah. So my my range is between two hundred and and two forty, uh, which I I you know two forty is is kind of my uh, if I would have to pick one I would say two forty, uh, but but yeah, <laughs> who knows what's gonna happen, uh, but I I, I do I'll think, take it. <laughs> yeah, I think that is uh, that is that that would actually signify that we don't have diminishing returns. That's a, 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 a like a, a really a, a big change to the dynamics of of the Bitcoin cycles. Uh, and so, so I think that's a price that we could even be very happy with. But, but, um, but we're gonna be somewhere. So if I'm gonna have to, if I'm allowed to, to kind of guess more loosely, then I would say somewhere between 200 and uh, and and a million. Uh, but uh, <laughs> depending on on these flows, you know, of the ETF. Uh, so uh, that that would mean that we would be somewhere between the previous cycle and the 2017 cycle. And I'll get also to a bit of the fundamentals why, uh, but but I, I I rather think we're going to be on the lower side, uh, as I said, due to the increase in the market cap. Because we have a higher market cap, um, it's just more difficult to uh, to push up that price. And so that's why uh, if we're going to be kind of in between the the previous two cycles, so the 2020 and the 2017 cycle in terms of of uh, of price, which we actually can see in this chart. Huh? So the the 2017 cycle is around that 250 thousand mark, uh, or that uh, this is the 2020 cycle, uh, and the 2017 cycle is uh, I think it's 1.2 million if we compare it from uh, from the the this current that. position. I take that. Yeah. So so I. I, I mean, if you think that we're um, that scarcity is increasing in Bitcoin, which it has been since the third halving, and and we'll get to that as well later on, um, it would be, uh, you know, it would not be strange to see uh, increased returns instead of diminishing returns. But due to the market cap increase, I think we're gonna r rather be more close to uh, to the previous cycle than to the 2017 cycle. But so it's a wide range, but uh, but yeah, I'm sorry, I cannot do better than that. Try try and do better next time. <laughs> I will. <laughs> uh, interesting. So yeah, what we were discussing is the the left translated cycle, right? So uh, because of the ETFs, because that uh, that is a catalyst that happened earlier uh, in the cycle than than usual, so it's kind of a unique event to this cycle. Uh, we have this left translated cycle where we actually see an all-time high, uh, you know, even before the halving, which we can also see here in this in this chart. Um, but just to to show why that isn't that strange, is uh, if if we look at actually most indicators, so also uh, just even uh, technical uh, in, in, uh, technical analysis indicators like the RSI, uh, but also on-chain indicators, we can actually see that the April top was actually the, the 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 top made in the indicators rather than the November top. So to get back to that, um, and 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 so here we're looking at the MVRV, which is uh, it's another fundamental on-chain indicator. So you can see these these blue vertical lines. Those align with uh, actually the, the tops of that indicator for that particular cycle, and we can see how much lower the value was in the in the November top. Right? It was. Uh, mm. it, I, and so the the hype was already gone after the China mining ban, and it didn't come back. And so that that second all-time high that we made there was still based uh, based on a bit of the belief of this long of the Hotler groups, with which everyone expected to go above 100k. And so that was an attempt, but uh, but there was no real demand, you know, to sustain that trend. And so that's why we barely made an, an all-time high there. And, and and again, we also saw like a d distribution top in in uh, in 2021. So you know, if we would have had a blow off top, or then then it wouldn't it would not have been even an all time high. But so you could argue that we already have been in a bear market since uh, April 2021, right? So uh, if you look at then the time from that April 21 peak 
towards uh, uh, the, the current all-time high, it's actually of similar magnitude to, uh, to the previous halving as well, uh, as well, to the previous cycle. And just to maybe uh, say a little bit what this indicator, what this indicator is. So the, the MVRV, uh, what it does uh, is, uh, so it's, it compares the market value against the realized value. Now, what is the realized value? That is the actual capital inflow into Bitcoin. So we can look at all the transactions of the blockchain. And uh, so the, the combined inflow of all those transactions is the, is the inflow. So that's the realized cap. And the market cap is is the price times the supply, right? So, and and so what we're actually looking at in this in this bottom indicator is the distance from the 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 realized price, which we actually can see here in the chart. So here I plotted the price with the realized price. So it's the the price with the average purchase price. That that dotted blue line is the average purchase price uh, of all Bitcoin. And so we look at the distance from that average price, uh, or how much price is above that average purchase price. And so that is what, what that's basically what what this uh, what what the bottom indicator here is showing. And so obviously, when price starts moving up fast, making new all-time highs, you get further above the average purchase price, uh, because there's a lot of inflow of new new people buying higher prices. And 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 so that's uh, so you can really see that there's a lot of hype in the market if this indicator is high, and and then we fall uh, even below uh, zero in, in during this bottom formation. And the bear markets, and currently we're uh, of similar magnitude to the 2019 rally that we had. So, you know, one could argue like, oh, maybe we'll have a similar event towards this 2019 rally. But the, the difference this time is that we actually see sustained demand from the ETFs, and so I, I, I expect uh, the rally to continue rather than to dissolve, uh, which we had in 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 2019. So, so the left translated cycle, uh, so meaning that we'll have an, an all-time high earlier than than previous cycle. If we measure again here, so here I align the cycles from uh, uh, from the cycle peaks, except I use for the for the the past cycle, I use the April top rather than the uh, the November uh, uh, cycle peak, which you, which you can see here. And then uh, if if we do that, we can see that we're actually really in line, and and we're actually following the path of the previous cycle. Uh, where we are now, and so this is another reason to uh, uh, to just uh, say that it's quite it's not that strange that we have an all time high before the halving if you if you think of the uh, the April top being the all time high. Hmm. Yeah, and then I wanted to get to uh, the 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 hotler behavior, um, and um, so uh, so you asked the question already: of what are what are long term holders doing? What are the hotlers doing? And 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 this chart is actually what shows. Uh, that so here I I have two different ways of uh, kind of measuring the hodl behavior on chain and, and one is long term holder supply and the other one is uh, illiquid supply. Um, there there are different methods to kind of measure the same thing. So one is time based, which is long term holder supply. So we we kind of just look at the age of coins. So if a coin is older than five months, it becomes part of the long term holders. Why five months? Yeah, so because this statistically it shows that after a five month cutoff, that uh, that it's a lot less more likely to for that coin to be sold. Right. And so you could use different time frames, but just statistically, the five months is a, is a is a is is one of the better cutoffs. And so that's why we use that. Whereas the illiquid supply, it, it actually doesn't. It's not time based. It looks actually at spending behavior. So there we see if an entity on chain spends more than 25% of their holdings, um, they, they are considered liquid and, and otherwise they are considered hi, uh, illiquid. You know? so, so if we spend less than 25% uh, of the holdings, it's considered an illiquid, uh, illiquid entity. And so um, uh, you, we can see that the time-based variance or so the long-term holder supply has these, these huge uh, decreases in, 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 in supply. You know? and, and that is actually... Because the time-based variant, as soon as a long-term holder sells their coin to a short-term holder, it actually takes a five-month period before that short-term holder can become a long-term holder. And, and so you have these uh, downturns in, in long-term holder supply. But the bottom of those downturns are the, essentially the top of the market. Those are yeah, but you but you don't know when those will bottom out, you know. But you but you can look at the rate of change in that indeed in, 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 in those. Uh, but 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 it's actually the other way around. It's when it's it's when price stops moving up, 
uh, obviously the long-term holders stop selling, you know, because it's it's just with each new all-time high, there is a max incentive for everyone to sell because you know the price literally has not it has never been a better moment in history to to sell some of your bitcoin it's an all time high right so mm. so as soon as you reach a new all time high and and that that is true for every all time high during a bull market <laughs> there was never a, a moment in history that was better for selling than that all time high until that day obviously when it starts moving up after then then it was not the best period but uh but but so that's why we get this max incentive to sell and we see that long term holders with these gigantic profits obviously they 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 do sell off some of their coins and actually in in 2017 we saw a drawdown of of nearly 3 million coins in long term holder supply but obviously that is bought up by by short term holders just quickly on that so you can mm -hmm. see there's a little dip in the long term holder supply at the moment um, you don't actually tell if that's going to like a known exchange wallet. That's just it moving. Is that right? Th this is uh, not not the supply on exchanges. This is actually the the supply that that moves uh, on chain. So, do you think there could also be a little dip in that because fees have been so high for so long? They're a little lower now, and people are consolidating. Or do you, is that not enough to make such an impact? I, I think that's not enough. That that yeah. would be an impact during like a bear market or so, uh, in, but but not uh, in a bull market. We have these downturns because of uh, of of uh, you know high price increases. High price increases uh, incentivize selling a portion of of the Bitcoin, uh, and and uh, the, the reason why we do not see that in illiquid supply is because if. Uh, if if someone that has a long term hold uh, like a hodler that has uh, illiquid coins, if they sell a bit of their portion, less than twenty five percent, they remain illiquid, and the person buying that is actually by default illiquid until they start spending more than twenty five percent of their holdings, and so uh, that's why illiquid supply just doesn't show that kind of same same volatility. But in the end, uh, you know, we have these downturns in the bull market, but then. Uh, again, these lines start to align, you know, and we see that that currently the current position of these lines is, is uh, only less than five hundred thousand uh, Bitcoin apart, you know. So, so they're they're very similar, and they kind of move up in the same fashion, except that the long term holder supply has a lot more volatility due to these uh, this time base being a time based variant. But but this kind of shows me that that the behavior. The trend of the hodlers is that that uh, that supply is generally getting more illiquid, right? And so, uh, it, for me, it's kind of confirmation that uh, that illiquid supply is a fair, a reasonably fair measurement of this hodler behavior, uh, because we have these two different ways of measuring uh, this this hodler behavior. And so, uh, all time highs are a good a good opportunity to redistribute coins to new hodlers. Exactly. Yeah, I, I yeah. and it just happens naturally. I mean, uh, if you're up two hundred and fifty percent of your uh, uh, on your portfolio, uh, you know, people tend to make take some profits. Uh, you know, you never, never, no one has ever gotten poor by taking some profits, and so uh, it's 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 normal that this happens. And in and actually, the biggest drawdown that we saw was in two thousand seventeen, where we saw uh, in nearly three million coins. Uh, uh, becoming uh, a short-term holder, uh, and so uh, so uh, so that's the drawdown in the long-term holder. That was the biggest uh, outflow, but it it really depends on the length of the bull market because it's just uh, the more all-time highs we'll have, the bigger the drawdown uh, in 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 long-term holder supply. Uh, but that later will, will uh, I mean, it's met with <laughs> with with other buyers that will start huddling again. So. Uh, that's why uh, after the, the bear market, after the five month period, you start to see this increase again because this is the increase in this long term holder supply is literally short term holders becoming long term holders, uh, mm. and, and 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 so that uh, that is also to be expected again. This similar behavior in the in the next bull market, and then to get back to the HODL model to kind of give an update from uh, from the from the last appearance, um, is that. Uh, uh, we have had, an, in my opinion, an inflection point in the third halving, mm. where where illiquid supply is outpacing the new supply issuance. You know, so uh, so we've had illiquid supply. The growth rate was about fourteen hundred coins a day on average, and, and the halving is nearly done. Uh, so uh, whereas the the new coins that were added to the network 
we're only 900 or 910 coins a day on average. This chart is going to look so interesting in another four years. Yeah, then we will uh, we will have a 450 inflow uh, in the circulating, uh, like uh, in supply issuance. And uh, we will see what the growth rate will be of the illiquid supply. I'm also very curious. But I think it's going to put upwards pressure, you know. Uh, of course. So the interesting thing here is that if we look at the supply issuance in the first halving or, uh, or even pre-halving one, we had about 7,500 coins added per day uh, to the network. After the first halving, there was a reduction you know, that, that, that amount more or less got halved. And so we have only three, uh, 3,900 coins a day that were added to the network. The reduction that we see here is similar to the demand of the current ETFs <laughs> approval. <laughs> now, it's only little data. We've only had two months of, of data from the ETFs. And there's a difference between, as I, I explained before, there's a difference between a, a true supply shock caused by the protocol, which uh, you know is just, it, it, there's more volatility uh, fluctuations with the ETF approval, and it's part of the demand, which, uh, which can change over time. And so, so it's, uh, it's, it's not the same thing, but still the magnitude that we're seeing from this supply crunch that we're, that we're currently having uh, is, is of that magnitude of the first having, which I, I think is, is, uh, is really incredible. So if this trend continues, and that's what the HODL model is about, right? So this is the conservative variant of the HODL model where we kind of try to to map uh, uh, the growth of a liquid supply. And so this is a very conservative me measurement. Um, so we, we, we see here the total supply, the liquid part, and then the HODL model, which kind of maps this into the future. And uh, the bottom part of the chart is, is the same thing, but in percentage terms. So how much percent of the supply is a liquid? And so we start out very high with 100% the liquid, and then we, can we move down towards 70% of the supply being a liquid uh, at the inflection point, uh, which is the highest amount of, of available supply for trade, which is that the, the orange uh, supply that is here. And we have started to move back up and we've actually started to move back up significant, even mm. faster than this conservative model. Uh, and I've just showed why I think Ill illiquid supply is a fair measurement of this HODL behavior, uh, you know, versus long-term holder supply. Um, and so, uh, so if our measurements are correct, then <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin is becoming more scarce since the third halving. And so that's going to put upward pressure on price and ETF demand will as well. And so, so yeah, I think um, uh, we're up for a bull market. Wow. Got in about three cycles time, it's going to be insane. Yeah, so this was the conservative model. But then if we look at the HODL model S, which, uh, which we looked at last time as well, uh, which is a lot more bullish. You know, here we kind of just go from 100% to 70% back to 100% at a more or less equal pace, which we currently we're still uh, above that, that model value. And so uh, we've had a bit of a downturn uh, in recently in, uh, in illiquid supply. And uh, that was actually exactly with the FTX sell-off. I, I actually think there were some... Um, some uh, some wallets that became uh, liquid suddenly because of uh, spending more than twenty five percent of holdings, or you know, uh, uh, due to the ETF approval. So there we saw a bit of a, a change in, in liquid supply. But since then we've we've kind of been moving back up again. So I think yeah, this this trend will continue. And yeah, to me this this chart is the most insane chart because this this actually implies hyper Bitcoinization by twenty thirty. Yeah, and uh, that is still unimaginable. To me, even like uh, you know, I'm bullish on Bitcoin, but this is just uh, that that would be insane. And maybe it will go as fast, you know. Uh, but uh, I made a conservative model for a reason. I, I I'm not I'm not guaranteeing that this model will hold. But currently, we're above the hot uh, model value. And if you think of just logically, rationally, it's about, the logic. That's why I don't think it's insane because yeah, it's logical. It's very logical. But does hyperbitcoinization not mean that a liquid supply will drop because people are actually using bitcoin no i think hyper bitcoinization is where the total market cap of bitcoin eviscerates any other sovereign currency but i want yeah. everyone using it i want people like earning i in think it, that comes after it. i think that comes after i think what happens during this is if, so at the moment we, i think still think we've got early adopters 
I think we're going to get to that phase where people like everyone's like realizing, shit, I need Bitcoin. Shit, I need Bitcoin. And it's just going to be a fight to get Bitcoin. And that's what's going to drive this. That's what I think. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, demand for Bitcoin will just drive up Bitcoin's price, you know, so, uh, and, and I mean, the US dollar will keep in, inflating as well. And so, so uh, I, I think we'll, we'll just get to prices, you know, from, from a million to 10 million at some point. And then Bitcoin is going to be such a big currency that it's, that, that it's just, you know, it becomes a more, a better currency than, than the US dollar, obviously. Uh, and, and so that transition to start moving Bitcoin, like the dollar as a medium of exchange versus Bitcoin, or, uh, or to start using Bitcoin versus the dollar, that will also be a, like a gradual transition, you know, and maybe in the shape of how we've seen with El Salvador, you know, where they use both currently. But then at some point, they're suddenly going to use one Bitcoin more than, than the dollar, you know, which now they still use the dollar more than Bitcoin. But at some point, we're going to see that shift. Um, but logically, I think this model makes just a, a lot of sense. We had a high inflation rate in the beginning. You know, we, we literally saw that like 7,000 coins per day were added to the network pre having one and then 4,000 coins were added to the network. We had 18 million coins that were added to the network uh, before the third halving. That's a very high inflation rate. And, and so there needs to be a lot of demand to, to, for all those new coins, you know. But after the third halving, the inflation rate actually now after the fourth halving, the inflation rate will, will drop below that of gold. So we're actually, you know, Bitcoin is becoming scarcer and we can see it in the data. We can see, you know, Bitcoin being a store of value, you know, illiquid supply is, is, is trending up. And so that means available supply for trade is shrinking. And so Bitcoin is becoming more scarce, which will put more pressure on price into the future. And so price is going to move up faster. But on the other hand, as I said, we have this growing market cap that will, again, kind of... Uh, put this this more it's more difficult to to move up in price with a with a with a bigger market cap and so uh, so it's going to be something in between <laughs> uh, the, those two uh, it's an it, look it's an S curve going into a shrinking issuance right yeah so it's it I, I yeah I I for me it's a, just a very bullish outlook uh, uh, we we can see in the data that the available supply for trade is shrinking, and so it's going to put upwards pressure on price. And I don't know how high the market, uh, how how high the Bitcoin price will go, and and what kind of events we will see. I, I'm actually here talking about the rational kind of fundamentals. Um, how the irrational market is going to absorb all of this uh, is to me still unknown. But but I try to look at that with with the cycle analysis and the indicators uh, more on a day to day basis, right? Just to keep track. We, it's very hard to predict that into the future. Danny, why are you I, smirking? Because I, I think we should, uh, I would fade this model. So I, I think we should make a bet, Pete, that in going into halving six, that I think a liquid supply will be dropping because I think people will be using Bitcoin a hell of a lot more than they are today. I don't. I think there's even more incentive at that point to, to not use it. Mm -hmm. Well, there so you go, the, 100K the sales. Thing, <laughs> to, to get to that, Danny, I, I think... Um, the thing there to understand is that with price moving up, uh, you just need less Bitcoin. Uh, uh, you know, the, with the price moving up, you're just going to transfer sets instead of whole Bitcoins. You know, so mm -hmm. so uh, we and even millisats on the Lightning Network. So we could trend up to even 99% of the supply being illiquid and only using 1% as a minimum of change, and that is millisats on the Lightning Network. That, that could support a whole economy. So it's, it's not that we need a certain amount of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is divisible. And so there's always enough Bitcoin to, to, to be able to use as a medium of exchange. It's just that you send less Bitcoin around. You send uh, a transaction of a sat in, rather than uh, you know, a, a million sats. I just think adoption might outpace price at some point. I, I think I think people are going to start moving to living on a Bitcoin standard. I think more and more people will. and that just naturally leads to a liquid supply dropping. But I could be totally wrong. Yeah, so we will see into the future. So uh, to get to the next chart, so if we look at the available uh, supply for trade, um, you know, since the inflection point, since the third halving, we've been moving down. So that is, and, and, and so my expectation is that we will uh, be somewhere between the S model and the, and the uh, normal HODL model. Uh, and so it's, it's difficult to see where we will go uh, but for now, we're still below the the, the HODL model S, and so uh, it's, it's uh, yeah. 
your Hoddle Model S, I, I think you need a, a Hoddle Model Super S because you're even outpacing that one. Yeah, currently, but uh, you know, I I, I, <laughs> I rather stay conserved. I think 2030 is conserved. It's, uh, it's, it's quite optimistic, to be honest. It's two cycles. But you could argue the Hoddle Model S is conservative. Uh, from the current data, yes, but uh, mm -hmm. but in my view, it's just so optimistic to have hyper Bitcoinization by 2030 that that uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I'm Listen, I'm not... our brother, our brother CK would say you're not bullish enough. Yeah, he would. He would definitely say that. Wow. Yeah. So, so that is uh, kind of the data I'm seeing, and so I'm I'm. Yeah, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin in the long term and even in the short term uh, due to the demand by the ETFs, which I've uh, tried to explain. And uh, and uh, so this is, uh, I, I kind of end with this chart, unless you, you, you still have a lot more questions, we can continue talking. But um, the so the on-chain, uh, this is the on-chain value map. And this actually incorporates a bit of the, um, of the um, available supply for trade. And and so it has. Kind of, I, I published this model before making the bottom of the of the previous bear market. So it was somewhere after the twenty one cycle top where I started posting this chart. Um, and we've made a bottom since, and we're moving up. And we can see now that we are at this uh, overvalued level, which uh, obviously happens in in, in bull markets. Um, and and but I just wanted to point out that like every. Every cycle, we have actually been at that overvalue level before the halving as well. So in a way, I mean, yes, we have seen an all-time high now before the halving. But um, if you take into account that the that the previous uh, uh, cycle top uh, uh, was a distribution top in 2021, and also that the supply was the most abundant in, in Bitcoin's history around that third halving, it is not that strange to uh, to to now make an all-time high, uh, you know, compared to that kind of low top that we've seen there. So that is just kind of what I wanted to end with. Um, you know, I don't know where we go from here. Um, we're, we're actually due for a correction, but but uh, the the ETFs are I just keep on uh, you know buying up all this uh, supply, and so uh, we haven't seen. We had a correction yesterday. Yeah, but it, but I mean, uh, we had a Satan that, candle. Even that, that was it was a 10k candle, but it was already bought up, you know, like uh, just in a few hours or so. It, yeah. it, it, it's it's not even a true correction. I mean, a, a, a 30 percent correction, like a revisit of the short term holder cost basis, which is currently at at at, at 47k or so and trending still trending up. Uh, that would be a correction uh, of the magnitude I, I'm talking about. That would actually be a healthy reset, but. Uh, you know, we we've seen that kind of after all these uh, reaching these uh, overvalued levels, but uh, we've had we haven't had a correction since 40k, and so uh, we're actually due for a correction. But uh, but the ETF demand is just eating up all that supply, and so it, it doesn't allow for any correction really to occur yet. Uh, so uh, so it'll be interesting to see that in the coming weeks uh, uh, how, how that will play out. Crazy stuff, man. So bullish. We need more Bitcoin, Danny. <laughs> this is amazing. It's insane. It's quite hard to comprehend. Well, thank you, you big orange carrot. Love this. Yeah, no, thank you for, for having me on. And um, sorry for, for kind of giving my whole presentation, I guess. Uh, I, I Do not apologize <laughs> for that at all. I loved it. I, I didn't let you speak as much, perhaps. Maybe you want to have uh, had more questions, but... Um, Bro, I asked all the questions I wanted to at the times I wanted to. Good. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy for you just coming and talk to us. Uh, I know uh, listeners have really appreciated the last two times you've been on. Right, how do we help you? Where do we send people? BitcoinStrategyPlatform.com? Yeah, that's uh, that's my platform. Uh, and you can sign up for the newsletter there, and uh, which uh, I've been discussing all these things for the past months as well. So uh, to be better informed. But uh, Yeah, sign up. Sign up, people. Support our brother, our brother, the carrot. Uh, amazing. Listen, uh, will we see you in Nashville? Uh, I hope so. I'm not sure yet due to family reasons, but uh, I, I, I'm going to do my best. I'll, I'll be uh, in Prague first in June. I don't know if you're going there. I'm not sure on Prague yet. We've got our, our own one next, uh, next month in Bedford. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we focus on that right now. But look, if I don't see you in Prague, hopefully Nashville... I'm sure we'll see you on the road somewhere. Thank you very much for, for having me on, Peter. 
always, man. Amazing. Thank you so much.